Thank you, Brooke. So I am absolutely delighted to have our speaker here today, who she doesn't remember me, but I believe I met her at a past Society for Economic Botany meetings. Um, and uh, I have a few things I'd like to say about her, but before I do, speaking on the herbarium thread, um, in some of the preparation for introducing Ina today, I uh, discovered a little bit from an, a Society for Economic Botany interview that she had done, I believe in 2020, perhaps, Ina. And uh, I was delighted to find that as a 10 year old, Ina engaged in a friendly competition with a neighbor to try to create the best herbarium to collect material from where she lived uh, and to identify it using field guides. So I think as you can see, this passion started early um, and has continued and we're glad for all the travails and getting here that we get to hear your work today. Dr. Ina Vandenbroek is a senior lecturer in the Department of Life Sciences and senior research fellow with the Natural Products Institute, both at the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, Jamaica. She is also an honorary research associate of the New York Botanical Garden. Dr. Vandenbroek's research is community-based and centers around the interconnectedness of Caribbean biological and cultural diversity, seeking to understand the patterns of traditional knowledge about the environment and cultural plant use for health, well-being, and food security. So without further ado, I know you're all here to hear Ina speak today. So Ina, thank you for being here. We look forward to your lecture. Thank you very much for this wonderful introduction. Let me pull up my presentation. All right. I'm gonna hide some controls. So thank you. I'm really very delighted to be here um, today for this lunchtime lecture and to talk about with you about uh, research that I have been involved in for 16 years while I was still working and living in New York City and working at the New York Botanical Garden. So um, it was a lot to compile and compress into uh, a one hour, 45 minute presentation. So that's why I'm focusing on lessons learned and I hope you will enjoy it. The title is Urban Ethnobotany, Traditional Plant Knowledge and Medicinal Plant Use by Caribbean and Latino Communities in New York City. So before I go into the particulars of uh, the research that I've been doing, um, I want to say a little bit more about ethnobotany as a scientific discipline and what this field is interested in studying. And the picture that you see here is from uh, rural uh, Jamaica. And Mr. Peter Tucker is holding the front of a tree fern. And he's explaining to me that um, this front it was traditionally used by Maroon freedom fighters uh, during Jamaica's history and occupation, colonization by the British, and served as a wonderful tool to hide themselves in the forest environment. So ethnobotany is interested in studying the links between biological diversity and cultural diversity. And we could call that together the diversity of life. So biocultural diversity is not only important uh, for cultural heritage, but also for community health and well-being, food security, sustainable development, social justice, and conservation of bio biological diversity. So it's diversity that links culture and nature through language. And for the purpose of this presentation, which is gonna be about urban ethnobotany, I wanna make my ca the case that this type of ethnobotany is not only something from the past are uh, confined to rural areas or remote forest areas of the planet, but that's also very much alive and well and culturally important in a big metropolis such as New York City. In New York City, immigrants bring with them their knowledge, their traditional knowledge, their worldviews, their cultural beliefs and practices about that they have about nutrition, about health, about plants as medicines, but they also bring their plants. And these are three pictures 
from um, the Bronx, where I lived and worked for 16 years. Um, on the top right, you see a supermarket in the Bronx, and you see that um, the, the foods that are available there are, are have signs that are in, in, in Spanish, because where I lived and worked is a predominantly um, Latino and Caribbean community. So you see Coco Malanga, you see Chayote, you see Yellow Ñame, and you also see Aloe Vera. On the bottom left, you see an interesting, um, two interesting different types of healthcare systems that are operational in New York City. On the right-hand side, you see an urgent care medical center. And on the left-hand side, you see Botanica San Santiago de los Caballeros. So you have traditional healthcare, traditional medicine, hand in hand with biomedicine. And on the right corner, on the bottom, um, you see Mr. Don Eliseo, who's holding up a plant called Anamu. And that plant, Pitiviria aliasi, is available both as a fresh plant, but also as a packaged herbal remedy. So in the US, medicinal plant use continues to be important for many immigrant communities. And there may be several reasons for that. Uh, one is that they may have difficulty accessing biomedical healthcare because of legality, uh, lacking lack of health insurance, are the perceived or actual costs of healthcare, um, also because of language barriers. But, and last but not least, it's also people's cultural traditions and beliefs that continue to drive their use of medicinal plants for community health. And the pictures that you see here are again uh, from New York City. Um, one of the students, Almesina Balbino, is standing in the basement in front of packages and packages of fresh plants that are imported from the Caribbean, but also from other places in the world. And that is not just the case in New York City. Here in this um, radio um, blog by Public Radio International in 2015, some Caribbean immigrants in Florida explained that that plant that you see here, Sena Alata from the Fabesi, may be considered by non-Caribbeans as a weed, but for Caribbean immigrants there, it's called king of the forest and it's an important medicinal plant. So in New York City, um, more than 30%, so one third of the population of New York City consists of people who are born abroad or in Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico is, is also included in this measure, but we really had to add Puerto Ricans because they are considered a US citizens. So if you look at the American community survey from people born abroad, you can see the, the ones that I've highlighted in yellow. And these are the four communities that we have been working with at the New York Botanical Garden. The first one is the largest um, foreign born group. These are immigrants from the Dominican Republic. But you see Mexicans and Jamaicans uh, are also part of the top five. And then we also included Puerto Ricans because the Bronx where the New York Botanical Garden is located is a, a, a large community of Puerto Ricans lives there. So we embarked on a project that we called by the acronym CARLO E2, in order not to have to say Caribbean and Latino ethnobotany and ethnomedicine uh, every time. So CARLO E2 is um, collaborating with these four communities to look at patterns of traditional plant knowledge. And I'll tell you more about that in a second. Before we started to write this grant proposal, we did a comprehensive literature review that, that showed the enduring importance of medicinal plants 
for Caribbean and Latino community health. Um, a review paper by Ortiz et al. in 2007 looked at uh, the use rates of plant medicines among several Car Caribbean and Latino communities in the, in the US and found that 20 to 90% of uh, people interviewed used plants as medicines. In New York City, one in four Dominican patients who visited the emergency room had taken herbal remedies before. And importantly, um, there, there are several papers saying that Latina women were less likely to disclose their use of herbal remedies to their healthcare providers in comparison with non-Latina white women. So on top of that, we know that there are huge gaps in, scientific, in the scientific knowledge. You know, the communities know these plants by their common names. Like you see a picture here of Miss uh, Michelle Dominguez in Obotanica. She's showing a leaf of a costus species that uh, is known by the common name Insulina. So you can guess what that plant remedy is used for. Yet, we do not know how many different species of costas are available in these botanicas in New York City. Then next to that, uh, what is the known efficacy from a, a review of the biomedical literature about these species? And how safe is it for community members to use them? So our model for comparative ethnobotany and ethnomedicine research aims to understand patterns of traditional knowledge and patterns of medicinal plant use among different Caribbean and Latino communities. So we can ask several questions. How similar is medicinal plant knowledge among these communities? And when people migrate, does that change the knowledge that they have about plant remedies? Do, do, does the use of plant medicines change? Another question is, what are the health conditions that are prevalently treated with medicinal plants in New York City? And which plants are most popular as herbal remedies? And then finally, what drives and what continue to drive people's use of medicinal plants? The picture that you see here is in a New York City community garden and a Caribbean community member is upholding epazote or apazote in the English speaking Caribbean. Uh, this species is known as um, semi-contract. So it's the Disfania ambrosioides, formerly Hinopodium ambrosioides. So this is a species that is that has a very widespread use, not only among Caribbean communities, but also throughout Latin America. So in 2005, when I started working at the New York Botanical Garden as a postdoc, we embarked on our first survey with the Dominican community in New York City. And we interviewed 175 people, men and women, lay people who did not necessarily identify as traditional healers or plant specialists, but who were born in the Dominican Republic. Um, on the map, you can see areas where um, many Dominicans in New York City live, in the Bronx, uh, in, in, in Washington Heights, in Upper Manhattan, uh, Corona in Queens, and there are also some dispersed settlements in Brooklyn. So we set out um, doing what we call interviews, semi-structured planned questionnaires, where we had a really long list of questions. And in addition, at some point, we also showed pictures. So that was in 2005. In 2017 and 2018, together with uh, my research team, we, con we conducted a larger uh, survey in New York City. And that was based on the results of our Dominican survey and, and really the wealth of knowledge that we um, recorded doing that survey, and then all the plant species that are available in those 
uh, botanica shops in New York City. So these specialized um, shops operated by Caribbean and Latino immigrants that um, sell plants for physical health uh, and spiritual well-being. So in, in those two years, we interviewed 400 different people in total who were members of four different communities, the Dominican community, the Mexican community, the Jamaican community, and the Puerto Rican community. And here on those GIS maps, you can see where in New York City, in which New York City borough, most members of these communities live. So we would visit these bar uh, barrios, these neighborhoods, and we would also, um, based from our um, own network of people who we knew already before we started the sur survey, do a, a methodology called snowball sampling. So first we secured um, ethics um, permission. We, we secured and obtained uh, ethics permission for this project, which is Institutional Review Board. It's, it's a long step process. And um, while conducting the 400 interviews, we also asked prior informed consent for every community member we interviewed. And um, something that, that prior informed consent is where you explain the project, but where you also uh, make it clear that if a person feels uncomfortable answering a certain question, they don't have to, if they don't want to share knowledge about certain plans, they don't have to, and so on. So the people who we interviewed were all age 18 years or older and born outside the mainland US. So it, they hailed from the Caribbean or they hailed from Mexico. So each, in each community, we interviewed 100 uh, persons. So and we tried as much as possible to balance gender, to balance age, um, to balance where they came from in um, their home countries, whether that was a rural area or an urban area. And then part of our survey, was to ask people to free list the plant remedies that they knew and used. We asked them also where they used them, uh, in their home countries, only in New York City or in both places. We also had structured interview questions, meaning um, very short answer, yes or no, or choosing between different options. And then we had more semi-structured and open-ended questions, meaning, you know, more general questions that gives people the opportunity to um, explain more about why medicinal plants, for example, are important to them. For our free listed plant remedies, uh, we got a total of 12,883 plant use records that corresponded with 527 um, scientific plant species. And then you also have to know, and I'm going to show you a few, few pictures of that. One species like this one here, Ceraci, uh, Cuniamor. Um, so you see Ceraci is the English name, but um, these are all interviews with Jamaicans. They know the same plant species, Momordica charantia, by three different names. Ceraci is the most common one, but some people will also know Carella or bitter melon. Then the Spanish-speaking uh, Caribbean or even Mexican people would refer to Cundiamor, for example. So after all the interviews, and, and oh, I want to go back and, and show you um, what is a plant use report that is one line here, one row in this table. For example, participant with uh, participant two uh, who was interviewed named Ceraci uh, to treat headache and the plant part that he or she used were flowers and um, a short description of the preparation without details to respect people's traditional knowledge. We are not um, recording full details on the preparation. So after we had this long list of common names of plants, we would try to find out what scientific species each of these common names uh, corresponds with. So we would do a ranking, we would go collect plant specimens all across New York City 
in botanicas. There is a network of hundreds, literally hundreds of botanicas in New York City. Um, several pop up, um, close again, but pop up somewhere else. So there is a lot of plant material available. When I started working in 2005, I thought, you know, this is an urban environment. There are no plants here. But boy, was I wrong. So if, if you have a plant that is known by the common name Sen, there are a number of species that, that can be. So after purchasing the plant material, we would um, do the um, botanical identification. And sometimes that can be quite challenging because you get only plant parts and not the uh, full voucher specimen with uh, flowers or fruit. So we would do not only repeated sampling, but we would also go to the Caribbean and um, make plant collections in the field. So for example, um, the roots of this species, which called dopigon or guauci or periquito or mani roots or yerba de la calentura, is available in New York City as dried roots. In order to identify that and to cross-link all these names, you need to make um, separate collections, but also go, go to the Caribbean and, and make that voucher, collect that voucher specimen in the field, and then compare with what is available in New York City. So one of the reasons to authenticate plant medicines is really to unambiguously link the common names or name with the scientific botanical name. And here you see for one species, you have several common names. It can also be that you have one common name for totally different type of species. So that's another reason why to uh, authenticate plant uh, medicine. So the, the correspondence can be one to many or many to one. So this is salvia or sage. Many of us who uh, are cooking and who are not from the Caribbean will um, mostly use salvia officinalis, which is the Mediterranean sage belonging to the Lamiaceae. But, um, if you go to the Dominican Republic and speak about sage or salvia in this case, you most likely will encounter Pluchea caroninensis, which uh, belongs to the Asteraceae, the sunflower family. And then if you go to Jamaica and you talk about sage, then you will most likely encounter Lantana camara, which again belongs to a different plant family, the Verbenaceae. So these common names for the Budding botanist can be quite confusing at the beginning. And there are many other examples of common names that are totally different species to what um, we're in, in the English speaking non-Caribbean language are commonly um, in the English speaking non-Caribbean communities are, are used to like dandelion, laurel, ginseng, and, and so on. So there are many different examples. So it's very important to make those plant collections. Once you know the scientific name, you can do a review of the biomedical literature and search for uh, the scientific name. Because let's say if you have the prickly pear cactus, Apuntia, or the nopal cactus, Apuntia cochinilifera, um, known in Spanish as tuna, and you're going to do tuna and toxic or toxicity to see if there are any toxicity aspects related to the internal use of the species, what you will get from PubMed is toxicity, heavy metal um, toxicity of uh, tuna fish. And that's, of course, not what you want. So if you then search for the scientific name, either the um, accepted name or the synonym, you will get information on certain small uh, clinical trials, in this case, a small clinical trial that is about um, the use of tuna pads, a beverage to treat um, glucose levels in the blood. So now I'm coming to six lessons that we have learned so far. Uh, the first one is, although this Caribbean and Latino traditional medicine is rooted in the past, is rooted in tradition, it is modern. It is dynamic. It constantly keeps adapting itself to 
uh, changing epidemi epidemiological context. And bear with me, here I have tried to visualize for the four communities that we collaborated with, the Mexican, Dominican, Puerto Rican, and Jamaican communities, um, the health conditions for which most herbal remedies were known and reported. So what you see from this figure is that there are in, in the top six, so the health conditions for which most herbal remedies are reported, that there are several chronic non-communicable diseases that are really prevalent, prevalent in, in our communities uh, today. So you have diabetes, you have stress and nervousness, you have hypertension, you have kidney and urinary problems. So traditional medicine may be used for uh, self-limiting health conditions like the common cold and flu, our stomach ache, but also the more serious and long lasting conditions are treated popularly with herbal remedies. And um, the ones highlighted with a box are illnesses that were also reported as being of greatest community concern. So you see definitely there's a lot of concern from those communities about diabetes, about hypertension, and about stress and nervousness. And you can imagine, you know, uh, being an immigrant in, in a big metropolis, it can be very stressful. So no wonder that stress and nervousness ranks so high as well. So second lesson um, learned is that Caribbean and Latino plant knowledge in New York City is very rich in plant diversity, even though we're in an urban environment, right? We're in a metropolis. It's also patterned according to cultural heritage. And I've tried to summarize that in a few graphs. So this is the breadth, the, the depth of, of the, the width of Carlo medicinal plant knowledge, the range of knowledge. So each community of 100 interviewees reported more than 200 different medicinal plant species. And this is based on scientific species, right? So getting that information together of the differing common names with uh, the scientific names. So scientific names, more than 200 each community. What you also see is if you look at the percentage of people mentioning is that the majority of plants are mentioned by less than five persons. So there does exist a wide diversity of plant knowledge. The next question that we can ask is how is this um, plant knowledge shared between these four communities. And you see these overlapping circles, right? Of the 527 scientific plant species, 87 are shared in total. So you see the top six of the shared species. So these are the most popular ones across Caribbean, the four Caribbean and, and Latino communities. And so these are the, the really well-known ones, the ones that are available everywhere. And what is popping up as well is that several food plants are, are really popular uh, herbal remedies. I will talk about that more in a second. The number of plant species that are outside any overlapping circle, and you see for Mexicans, that's 113 species, and for Jamaicans, it's 111 species, are really only mentioned by these communities. So then how similar are their plant pharmacopoeias of these four communities? And we calculated a simple Jakar similarity index for that. So whereby the number of uh, shared species, species that are known by two communities, because you compare two communities at once, the number of shared species is divided by all the species that are mentioned, the shared ones as well as the unique ones. 
So what we had expected prior to, um, you know, making this analysis is that Caribbean communities would have more shared knowledge. So that the Mexicans would be the ones, the, 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 the community who had the lowest correspondence or similarity with the other communities. But it turns out that first Puerto Ricans and Dominicans had the highest similarity, but then it was Puerto Ricans with Mexicans and Dominicans with Mexicans. So it was the, the Latino, the language here that grouped uh, the communities together, whereas Jamaicans who are English speaking had their own set of, uh, you know, uh, more unique uh, medicinal plant species to them. And that's why they were showed less similarity with the other communities. So lesson number three is that food plants become more important as medicines after migration to New York City. So we're always speaking about loss of plant knowledge, loss of traditional knowledge, but actually here we found that after Caribbean and Latino communities migrate to New York City, that knowledge becomes transformed and foods, regular food plants that are more easily available, for example, in supermarket or green grocers, take on more important roles as medicines. So this is, and, and um, Alejandra may uh, recognize this picture. This is um, Fordham Plaza, uh, not that far from the New York Botanical Garden across Fordham University, but all over New York City really, especially in areas designated as food deserts, these New York City green cards have been popping up. And this is um, community members selling um, vegetables and fruits. Here you can see sugarcane, you can see, I think, a mame sapote, and, and the more uh, you know, generally known like pineapple and, and so on. Um, so these, these food plants become part of the therapeutic um, medicine chest of these communities. So if we look at data specifically from the Dominican community, we see that before and after migration, so DR is surveys that we did within the Dominican Republic as compared to uh, the survey in New York City, we saw that really food plants, people start reporting on average significantly more foods that double as their function as medicines. And the ones that I call non-foods are those plant species that are only used as medicines. So while there may be some a certain degree of knowledge loss about those non-foods, those, those pure medicinal plants that people may not have that easy access to all the time in New York City, they certainly start reporting and using more food plants as medicines. And not only that, they are um, using these food plants more often to treat chronic non-communicable diseases such as asthma and chest congestion diabetes and hypertension. So again, showing that this medicinal plant knowledge is very modern and it really responds to, um, you know, what diseases, what health conditions are uh, most prevalent. And we saw that too during the COVID pandemic where community members began really to um, very intensely share information about food plants that, that were good for respiratory health. And they started sharing uh, through social media. So it's a very modern, a very uh, adaptive traditional medicine. Lesson number four, and I've spoken about that a little, is that the importance of botanicas in the healthcare system of New York City. Although for many of us, they may be invisible, they are very visible for community members and they function as an all round parallel healthcare system in New York City. 
So here is a, a picture of Botanica Reyes in um, Washington Heights. And you see outside the Botanica are the boxes of dried medicinal plants. And so Botanicas are very important for the community because Botanica owners and staff and prospective patients slash clients share, often, most often share the same language. And they also share uh, a known tradition of using herbal remedies. So we scouted 68 Botanicas in the Bronx and we, we asked, why are people going to a Botanica instead of seeing a physician? And there were many stories like this. A person would go to the biomedical healthcare system to get a diagnosis and a prescription, would walk out of the biomedical healthcare system, throw their prescription, prescription in, the, in, in, in the garbage tin, and would go to a Botanica and say, you know, I have, for example, hypertension, what medicinal plants can you sell me? So the main reasons for going to a botanica is the cultural tradition. Uh, people have uh, strong beliefs towards herbal remedies that are part of their tradition and they have faith in the use of herbal remedies. The fact that those herbal remedies are natural are also very important. And then they are much more affordable, especially when you don't, do not have health insurance. We also found out that the main conditions treated in Botanica were first and foremost spiritual well being, but also a number of chronic uh, non communicable diseases, such as migraines, again, depression and anxiety, very important, infertility, diabetes, kidney problems, and arthritis. So, by, by doing that, Botanicas really are very invaluable to the city because they more closely correspond with the WHO definition of health. And that definition says, health is not merely about the absence of disease. No, health is a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being. So imagine that, and imagine the importance of botanicas for community members. Lesson number five is that many of those Caribbean and Latino plants are understudied in the laboratory for their biological effectiveness. They're also, especially at the uh, uh, urban level in, in, in cities, understudied uh, in terms of cross-cultural comparisons of their use. Um, here you see that uh, Pitiviria aliasi or the Guinea henweed, the Anamu, is mostly used by and known by Dominican, Puerto Rican, and Jamaican communities. And here you can see the health conditions that several people reported using the species for. In the Caribbean, there is a great network of pharmacists, uh, botanists, chemists, ethnopharmacologists, natural product scientists, and also some biomedical doctors who uh, are looking at cross-country comparison of medicinal plants in the region. But in urban environments, that research is still lacking. Those plants are also very understudied clinically. So we're, we're looking at clinical studies, studies in humans. So again, for the same species and looking at the different health conditions that community members reported, ranging from cancer to sexual potency, we saw that there was only one study in, in the biomedical literature, a small clinical trial, not randomized, no double blind and so on. So that's why it's the type of the clinical trial is listed as other, only 14 people. And there was no um, effectiveness of um, Kini henweed of Pitiviria aliasi noted in that trial. But there does exist an animal study in which the leaf extracts in, tested in mice 
reduced fasting blood glucose. So here, here is one animal study that refers to uh, a potential diabetes effect. But again, we are lacking clinical studies. We are lacking human trials for this medicine. So our final lesson learned, and I, of course, I have much more lessons to share, but not within the 45 minutes that are allocated to me, but it's a very powerful one and a great one to end is that cultural health beliefs really drive medicinal plant use. What do I mean by this? Um, when we looked at uh, the earlier survey that we did with uh, people from the Dominican Republic in New York City, we asked everyone, do you believe that there exist illnesses that a medical doctor does not understand or cannot cure? And a whopping 80% of people said, yes, yeah, sure. So we asked, so which illnesses are these? And we got a long list of 21 illnesses, and this is the top 10. The first one is culebrilla, which um, actually corresponds with a biomedical disease. It's herpes zoster. So you, you, you may recall when you have a herpes zoster on the back, um, it's usually one side of your body, but people say it can form a ring and when the ring closes, the person dies. So that's why it's called culebrinia. Culebra means snake. Asthma and chest congestion, a chronic non-communicable disease, um, very um, important in, in urban areas where there's a lot of uh, smog pollution. But then you also see other conditions like brujeria, which is witchcraft, disipela, which is an, a skin infection can also be a parasitic disease. You also have mal de ojo, the evil eye. You have empacho, which can roughly be translated as a digestive blockade. So many of these illnesses or several of them are um, folk illnesses are what we call community, uh, community or culture bound uh, illnesses or syndromes. That means illnesses for which there are no direct one-on-one -on -one correspondence with a biomedical condition. So the evil eye, right, can be any, any uh, different uh, physical condition. A lot of people will say this, these are uh, psychiatric disorders. I, I do not uh, personally agree with that because if you look at the symptoms, there are a lot of, um, especially empacho or even evil eye, um, a lot of symptoms that are uh, physical, physical manifestation of, um, you know, real health problems. And going over the list of symptoms for each of these diseases with uh, biomedical doctors, with physicians, I would ask them, if a patient comes to you with these symptoms, would you say this qualifies for biomedical health care? And almost everyone uh, of the physicians would say, yes, absolutely. So, but there is a, a, a difference. Um, if you look at the former list of illnesses, remember those, you see the symbols here, you see the, the blood uh, from the finger, that's diabetes. You see hypertension, cancer, common cold and flu, heart problems, asthma. These are illnesses that community members um, singled out as being of high concern for the community. 89% of the people would consult a phys physician and biomedicine, pharmaceuticals would be the most commonly reported treatment, although plant remedies are also important. But if you look at those culture bound illnesses like brujeria, like empacho, mal de ojo, eh, even culebrilla, right, which is treated mostly by rituals only 45% of people would consult a doctor. And medicinal plants would be the prevalent type of treatment followed by spiritual remedies and also pharmaceuticals. So this shows that when you have a physical concern, patients may be inclined, very much inclined to visit a doctor and take pharmaceuticals. But when the community diagnoses these illnesses as being part of um, you know, the cultural patrimonium, uh, the cultural heritage of the community, 
people will prefer to use plants and spiritual uh, treatments. And that's important for doctors to know. So several doctors throughout the course of our 16 years of research here since 2005 have been reaching out to us really wanting to learn more about uh, not only the plants and what is known in the literature about the effectiveness of the plants but also about the cultural health beliefs the worldviews the healthcare seeking strategies of the Caribbean and Latino communities that we worked with so we've been working on an online module of the um, CARLO E2, Caribbean and Latino Ethnobotany and Ethnomedicine Research Program. And each module represents a PowerPoint. It starts with introduction to core concepts, um, the type of research lessons learned that I've been presenting today, um, then diving in deeper in what, um, you know, is similar and also what is different between the Caribbean and Latino communities. We've been collaborating with selected um, information on specific culturally important plants, uh, a specific module on folk illnesses or culture bound diseases, an important module on foods as medicines, um, on botanicas, and uh, the final module, module number 10, is promoting dialogue. How to create, how for physicians and doctors and medical students to establish a more uh, inclusive and um, dialogue with their patients in which they are not only telling them what they have and what they should do, but also listening and learning um, from them about what is important um, for them in using plants as remedies and about their uh, cultural traditions. And we also including uh, a couple of mini modules. So in conclusion, um, the six lessons learned that I've been speaking about, and each lesson learned has a different module in this curriculum that we are creating. And I want to end by saying that it certainly takes a village, not only to raise an ethnobotanist, uh, but also to conduct research. And we have to honor always those who came before us and um, you know guided us in our research, but also uh, very importantly, those are coming after us and who are continu continuing this research. So by uh, saying that, I want to end my talk here and open the floor for questions. Thank you very much.